All right. Well, in these uh, DNA Nexus coffee breaks, I strive to have everyone out of here by a uh, uh, quarter till the next hour. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm glad you're all here. Uh, thanks for coming on a special day. Uh, we were uh, helping out with uh, CDC Rice Baylor COVID symposium yesterday. So we had to push the coffee break uh, out until today. So uh, yeah, welcome to the last part of uh, explainable machine learning in three acts. And uh, I'm going to talk about explaining features with Chef. Um, and really, uh, shout out to Chow and Nick. Um, I think, uh, as you'll see, I think Chef is a really uh, sort of elegant solution for doing genotype phenotype work. Um, there are other machine learning solutions. Uh, I'll give an example. Um, and, and not to take anything away from uh, those researchers, they're phenomenal, uh, but just to show that, just to point out that th what they've done, I think, is, is really elegant. And so uh, kudos to them as we start off. So awesome. So my name is Ben Busby. Um, I drink coffee. There's a Chemex and a roaster and some other stuff here. Um, and uh, parafilm, I'm very proud of that. Uh, some of you know what that is. Anyway, uh, so yeah. And um, we have these coffee breaks usually every other week, um, short webinars on a topic related to biomedical data science. So uh, keep your eyes on the DNA Nexus newsletter, uh, our Twitter feed, as well as um, uh, LinkedIn uh, for future uh, webinars. Great. So what is DNA Nexus? Uh, basically we, uh, help folks analyze biomedical data and turn it into actionable information. Uh, we do a lot of work with uh, um, academic organizations, research organizations, of course, as well as with academic medical centers, pharmaceutical companies, um, hospitals, as well as government um, and clinical diagnostics, if I haven't mentioned that. Uh, so, and basically, uh, we have a unified data exploration and then a bunch of platforms uh, to do statistical and association analysis. Um, and everything I'll show you here, except for one slide, which I'll point out, uh, is work we did on the DNA Nexus platform. Uh, if you're interested in a demo, we can talk about that. Uh, but for these webinars to be useful, uh, you don't have to be a uh, DNA Nexus client. Um, really, I want to talk about data science generally, and then I'll mention how DNA Nexus uh, makes these things a little bit easier for you. Great. Um, so, and what are we effectively trying to do in biomedical data science? Why is, um, why is explainable machine learning important? Well, so often uh, what we want to do is explore our data, cluster our data, and then uh, think about why those clusters have those clusters. So if I think about something like um, uh, some, say, liver cancer, I want to be able to subset different etiologies of liver cancer. Um, and then I want to think about environmental and genetic features uh, that uh, lead to uh, those presentations. So uh, that's essentially what we're trying to do here. Some folks call it precision medicine. So uh, anybody can do this on the command line. So you can take, uh, you can take groups of uh, patients and uh, subset them. Uh, so uh, DNA Nexus has a fancy tool called Apollo uh, where uh, you can subset patients. For those of you who use the UK Biobank uh, platform, or sorry, for those of you who use UK Biobank data in your, uh, in your work, uh, soon we'll have a platform this summer uh, where you can use this for UK Biobank analysis of their whole exome, whole genome data, and imaging data with all the phenotypes. And so that's something I'm excited about. We've actually used this on the uh, uh, full UK Biobank uh, data set to look uh, at uh, adverse drug responses. So um, that's something that I'm, I'm very proud of. Um, and so uh, this work done by Chow and Nick, um, uh, we pulled, uh, we selected cohorts um, and looked at um, uh, ADR diagnoses. So, um, and then as I discussed uh, two weeks ago, 
Um, we uh, uh, Chow selected uh, uh, LightGBM uh, to do the machine learning analysis on this data, um, really because of clusterability and sparsity of the phenotypic data, um, which I think uh, makes a lot of sense. And so that's that's something that's exciting. Um, and uh, uh, she and Nick uh, were able to get uh, to tune models and uh, pick out features uh, that were relevant. And that's great. Again, what we're doing uh, is we're thinking about both penetrant complex genotypes as well as exposures. By the way, April 29th, uh, I'm giving a full length webinar on epigenetics um, and why that's important in biomedical data science. So stay tuned for that. Uh, if that's something you're interested in. Great. Uh, the other thing I discussed last time uh, was how having an appropriate number of classes uh, really helps uh, sort of the baseline of model tuning. Um, but what we really want to get into in the focus of today uh, is to think about uh, explainable uh, some classes. And, and so what I want to do is take a step back uh, and think about uh, explainable machine learning a little bit sort of more in general, um, and then talk about uh, SHAP more specifically, and then go into SHAP uh, to analyze this particular data set. So I'll get into that uh, in just a minute or two here. So we're not the only people interested in explainable subclasses. As I mentioned, uh, yesterday I was uh, helping out uh, with a symposium on COVID, and uh, this is... Uh, work from Elena Kazaragi from the University of Milan and colleagues uh, doing, uh, have, looking at feature relevance uh, for in COVID infection. Um, and so uh, using relatively similar techniques, uh, they uh, used an ensemble of machine learning techniques um, and then used the Varuna method, uh, which is something I'm a fan of. Um, and so uh, that's really neat work. Um, and like I said, uh, I think Chow and uh, Nick have done some really elegant work uh, with Shep that that really sort of, uh, it's not the same data sets, of course, uh, but really have uh, uh, sort of put a finer tip point on such analyses. So I'm, I'm really proud to, to show those to you today. Um, and so here, uh, really, what does Shep do? Well, basically, it ranks features. Um, so it, it tells you really, um, what is important where and and this is an enigma that I think about sometimes uh, just for fun is you know why don't people live past say 117 years um, and I think you know it's it's actually pretty important to say uh, what contributes to people not dying and, and what you see here is, is not very much so uh, whereas a lot of people contribute to people dying although we sort of part of that is perspective because we think about people dying as a, as a sort of a primary focus. Um, anyway, so um, I can also uh, think about, um, you know, like when things are more dangerous. And interestingly, uh, when, you, when you think about things like high blood pressure, high blood pressure in younger people is actually more dangerous uh, than high blood pressure in older people, which is a bit counterintuitive. Uh, but I think these things are really uh, interesting. And I think as we'll see with uh, the SHAP on the ADR data, I think that it's really interesting to, or it's really important to note that a lot of these things are really sort of uh, hypothesis and experiment generators uh, rather than a final story. I mean, I think, frankly, we are a long, long way from having the sort of robot doctor uh, vision of the future that some folks have. Uh, so, and then we can see other counterintuitive things. Uh, you know, we think of uh, uh, sort of age and sex. Uh, you know, I mean, we, we often think of, about older people um, and how males die earlier, but it turns out that uh, that flips when folks are younger. Um, and then, uh, here, I want to go into this uh, real world uh, application for uh, uh, adverse drug responses. Um, and so what I want to do uh, is go in and look at uh, sort of normalized features uh, versus the SHAP values. And, and I'm going to go from things that are really obvious and things that we would 
absolutely expect to things that are less obvious, but really intriguing in terms of, again, setting up new experiments. So here's an obvious one. So these are the, the number of medic medications taken. So uh, here you see normalized values on the uh, y-axis and then chat values on the x-axis. So this is really a positive control showing you that if you take a lot of medications, you're more likely to have an adverse drug response and that weighs more into the model, right? So that, that should make sense to everybody. I hope it does. And obviously there's some underlying factors here when we see an extension on the x-axis uh, where we suppose, uh, again, hypothesis generation, that some of these features um, uh, have other underlying etiologies besides just the drugs themselves. Uh, and uh, one example of that, when we start thinking about uh, cancer and cancer drugs, uh, really uh, when you have cancer, uh, that plays very large into the model, as one would expect. Cancer patients tend to be on way, way more drugs than uh, the average population. So um, you could call that sampling bias, whatever you want to call it. But uh, certainly interesting in my, um, in my estimation. And we actually see a fairly similar phenomenon also uh, for self-reported non-cancer incidents. And interestingly, that seems to plateau. So uh, if you think about um, sort of the, uh, the amount of uh, illnesses versus the SHAP values in the model, uh, sort of turn this on its side and flip it around, uh, you think about those values plateauing. So interestingly enough, people either aren't taking more drugs or the propensity of their uh, illnesses to cause ADR uh, plateaus out. It's probably some combination uh, of those two things. But again, this is an intuitive plot. But next, I'm going to show you some really less intuitive plots that, again, are intriguing, hypothesis-generating, um, and not necessarily obvious on the surface of it. Uh, so here, uh, this is really interesting. So here I'm seeing basophil count, and I'm seeing an extreme variability um, in basophil count um, and SHAP values, uh, and SHAP values uh, contributing uh, to ADR. I think that makes sense uh, because uh, basophils, and, and really particularly uh, basopenia, uh, are uh, related uh, to uh, allergic reaction. Um, so high basophils uh, are often related to allergic sensitivity, um, and low basophil basopenia is uh, often related uh, to allergic reactions. So seeing this biphasic plot uh, is not uh, terribly shocking to me. Uh, on its own. That said, um, then here we can move over to hemoglobin concentration, and uh, we see actually uh, something really interesting, um, to me anyway, uh, which, which has struck me about this whole ADR data set. From the time I first read Chow's blog post, hopefully all of you have read it by now, um, until and, and working through data analysis with Chow and Nick, one thing that, that keeps striking me is, so here what we see in the upper left quadrant are presumably really healthy people. Uh, you know, have, they have high hemoglobin counts, they probably exercise, those types of things. We can make up as many just so stories as we want um, about these people. But what you see up in the upper left are presumably healthy people. And as, as we see a decline here, we see this very large uh, extension uh, out in these sort of medium uh, hemoglobin concentrations. And that uh, there may be a number of underlying factors there um, and certainly something that uh, blood experts may be interested in. Finally, uh, looking at platelet distribution, uh, with platelet distribution, uh, it seems like we have a number of populations, some of them uh, where platelet distribution is an extreme factor. Um, in, uh, in, in the contribution to SHAP. But I would actually argue to you that these extreme uh, populations probably make a lot of sense. And they probably make a lot of sense because ADR is extremely high for drugs uh, that deal with low platelet count. Um, so I would expect, and this is a testable hypothesis, granted one I haven't tested yet, that 
the low platelet count uh, that, that these extreme populations over here where SHAP values are very high um, really come down to uh, folks who are being treated uh, with drugs uh, that tie into low platelet count. Uh, so, may, and maybe that is a direction uh, that we can go in, uh, really as a proof of principle uh, for what is a uh, testable hypothesis from SHAP values. I'd love to be able to come back to you in a month or two and say, here, let's have another coffee break when we're, where we talk about uh, platelet count and ADR. <laughs> that said, um, again, you can uh, check out the blog post that I mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, if you missed la the webinar two weeks ago, you can check out like GBM as well as Bayesian hyperparameters. Um, thanks again uh, to Nick and Xiao, uh, really drivers of this research, uh, and the rest of these folks uh, for really helping to put this webinar together. So uh, with that, uh, have a great couple of weeks. Again, uh, stay tuned for our epigenetics uh, webinar coming out uh, at the end of April, April 29th, I believe. Uh, so thanks a lot and uh, have a great day.